How can you tell whether somebody is a cultural Christian or someone has actually experienced a spiritual rebirth, transformation? Here's Pastor Dean in Sarah. The first thing I'm looking for out of the gate is what they believe and not just a generic belief in God. I wanna know what they believe to be true about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Like what is he actually truly done? I'm not asking them to write a theological paper. You know, I want to make sure they're clear on what we call first tier issues that Jesus died for our sins, he was risen again. Like those things have to be clear. And, and, and not just academically, but that actually then it means something. That's the next thing. Like there's been a repentance of sin. There's been a response to that. So I'm looking for belief, which we'll call faith, but like not generic faith, like faith in the Jesus of the Bible. And then I want to look for repentance that has led to them forsaking their former life and living the new creation that God has given them. This is Family Life Today. Our hosts are David Ann Wilson. I'm Bob Lapine. How can we help someone who may be a cultural Christian to understand that their Christianity is lacking? We're going to talk more about that today. Stay with us. And welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us. We are going to talk about some really serious stuff today with our guest Dean and Sarah. But before we get to Dean, this is crunch time. Yeah, I tell you what, when I, I don't know, Bob, what you think of when you hear crunch time. You I'm think of old, the fourth quarter, don't I'm you? I'm an old quarterback, two minute drill. You know, you need to score. The scoreboard's up there. You got no timeouts. I mean, again, I'm, it's, you feel that. And it's like in that moment, Everybody in that huddle, everybody on your sideline has to be all in. Yeah. And when you say crunch time, it's year end. It's been one of those years. Yeah. I don't know if we've ever had a year like this ever in my life. And so crunch time means, are we going to step up? Or are we going to be a team that wins? Mm. And it doesn't happen without every one of us saying I'm in. And what I mean by that is I mean financially, family life depends on listener support financially. We need your prayers. We need your help. We're bringing you help and hope. We're asking you to bring us help and hope by saying, I'm going to be a partner. I'm going to step in that huddle. I'm going to give you everything I got, and I'm going to jump in. And again, it's easy to sit in the stands and watch. You win ball games with people getting in the huddle and saying, I'm in. And I tell you what, we're in. We're inviting you to join us as well. This is year end. It's a beautiful time to say, I want to be a part of something that's making a difference, and you can do that. And the next three days make a huge difference. What we hear from you over the next three days is going to determine what 2021 looks like. And we need you because this is the last week of giving in December. I mean, we're excited about the new year, but this is critical for family life. It's critical for families. And so we need you. Well, and again, we got some good news recently. We, We had a $2 million matching gift that here in the last few days, people have stepped up and said, we really want to see family life Hmm. cross the goal line (laughs) and score. So they have increased the amount of the matching gift. It's now $2.7 million. So that means when you donate today, your donation is going to be matched dollar for dollar until we take full advantage of that matching gift opportunity. And we want to say thank you here at year end with a couple of special gifts. The first is a copy of my book, Love Like You Mean It, which came out this year, which has gotten great response. I've been very encouraged by the response from listeners. It's a great book, Bob. Well, thank you, guys. In addition, we want to send you a flash drive that has the top 100 plus Family Life Today radio programs from the last 28 years. Programs with you guys, programs with Dennis and Barbara Rainey, programs about marriage, about parenting, about extended family relationships, great stories of God's work in people's lives. We'll send you both the flash drive and the book, and your donation will be doubled when you give today. Go to familylifetoday.com to give online or call 1-800-FL-TODAY to make a year-end donation. And let me just say thanks in advance for whatever you're able to do. We hope to hear from you this week. And we hope Family Life Today continues to be an encouragement to you and a blessing to you in 2021. Now, we're going to talk today about people who are Christians in name only, really, is what we're talking about. I remember a conversation I had years ago with a friend of mine who was a a single mom, and she was in her early 30s, and she really wanted to have another baby. But she was a single mom, but she met a guy, 
And she came into the office one day and she said, I've met this guy. And I said, tell me about him. And she starts talking about him. I said, so is he a Christian? And she said, no, but I, I think he's close. And I said, well, you shouldn't even be having a conversation until this issue is settled. And I could tell. It was kind of like, but I really want to have a baby. So she came in one day and she said, it happened last night. I said, what do you mean? She said, we were up to like three in the morning talking. And finally, he he prayed to become a Christian. And I said, well, tell me about the conversation. And so we went on with this. I said, this is great. She said, so we can get married now. And I said, well, hang on, time out. <laughs> you probably need to just watch this for a little while and see, does he like Jesus because he loves you or does he really love Jesus whether you're in the picture or not? She ultimately married him, got pregnant, he left. Oh. And I've looked back on that story because a lot of people think the hurdle we're looking at when we talk about somebody becoming a Christian is that prayer hurdle. And that's giving birth, right? But you need to watch for the signs of real life once that prayer has been prayed to know, is there something really going on? We're talking about this because we're talking about what it looks like to be an unsaved Christian. That's the title of a book that our guest, Dean and Sarah, who's joining us again today on Family Life Today, has written. Dean, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you guys. You've done enough premarital counseling as a pastor. Lots and lots. You've seen this kind of scenario, right? Where Definitely. Where you've got somebody who really loves Jesus, who is attracted to somebody who kind of likes Jesus. And then they'll justify their attraction to that person. They'll see themselves as, oh, God's put me here as an evangelist, or or, or they might just abandon their theology they have for everybody else, where everyone else needs Jesus in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. This person all of a sudden gets an exemption because they're a great guy. <laughs> oh, I was <laughs> an expert at this. I would bring these boyfriends to Jesus and like, I can't date you unless you're a believer. And so they'd pray that prayer and nothing changed. Right. And so when I met Dave, my husband, you, <laughs> man, he was going hard after Jesus and displaying. Finally, and, a and man you could. <laughs> exhibiting so much fruit, like his life. It was beyond what anyone else I had dated exhibited in terms of he was living the gospel well, and fruit was evident. It's interesting. We've already talked this week about this, but all three of you had an interesting conversion story. I thought I was a Christian. Then I realized I wasn't and I became one. Mine's the same. Yeah. So it's, I wonder how many people have that story because mine involved a girl and I'm dating her and I gave my life to Christ and she starts being warm to the gospel and warm to the Bible, but nothing changed. And then when I realize she's seeing another guy, I go home, get on my knees, and that's my moment. Yeah. And I, you know, how many people have you heard share their testimony? And their testimony is, right. when I was seven, when I went to camp, when I was 13, I prayed the prayer, threw the stick in the fire, did all of that. Wait, threw and the prayed stick the in prayers, the fire? Oh, you don't know the stick in the, in the fire, fire thing? <laughs> Dean, explain the stick in the fire to these guys, will you? Church. Yeah. <laughs> is that, does that symbolize like your old life and yeah. your sins and yeah, your, 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 church your, camp. your secular CDs from the 90s? <laughs> And things like that. <laughs> your church camp at the big talk, you come up with a stick and you're throwing your sins, you're throwing it all in the fire. Oh. You really do throw a stick in the oh, fire. Yeah. Did you ever throw a stick in the start, fire? No, you grew up in a mainline church. church. Yeah. Yeah, I know. yeah, I was a mainliner. There was <laughs> no fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the testimonies we've heard over and over again right. from people who say, this is when I, what happened when I was a kid or when I was a teenager. And then there's the great lapse. And then they will often say, then I made Jesus Lord. Now, Dean, I want to ask you about that. <laughs> Here we go. In that gap between the stick in the fire and making Jesus Lord, if they die, do they go to heaven? I would, well. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There you go. Sorry, Dean. <laughs> All the world waits for your answer. I would say no, uh, because salvation is not a hocus pocus rite of passage or some kind of moment. Salvation is a response to your understanding of the good news of Jesus Christ. And the process of I made him Lord or whatever people like to say, I would argue the better way for them to put that, and that's the language they certainly use, would be uh, now I understand for the first time. <laughs> now I actually understand. What we've done in, in America especially is we've just created this kind of superstitious, again, kind of hocus pocus rite of passage that we call coming to faith in Jesus 
that requires no repentance, no really clear understanding besides a prayer. And it's, it's led a lot of people astray. I can't tell you how many folks come up to me who are 22 years old, who are 25 years old, 18, kind of in that age range, and they'll say, I want to get baptized. And in our, in our denomination, we baptize believers by immersion. And, and it's a second tier issue for us. We don't think that like we're better Christians because of that. That's just how we, how we practice uh, baptism. So I'll ask the person the question, well, what makes you want to get baptized? And they will say, when I was a kid, I was sprinkled, or they'll say when I was seven, I went in the pastor's office and with my parents and prayed a prayer and got baptized that day, but I don't think I've really actually understood it or knew it. I more just said yes and did what they told me to do. Right. So I think I need to get baptized again. I'm like, well, you know, there's not two baptisms. So, so I just make sure that I know that this actually really is their first baptism. And we tell people no sometimes, too. We don't just throw them in the water. But if, if we leave, and by no, I mean we'll say, no, I think you knew yeah. by your explanation. Maybe you just needed some repentance issues down the road, had some. It's not a rededication. Maybe you just kind of had some wandering in your life. It seems like you know. Uh, but what's happened is that we have made a gospel presentation when it comes to this context that we're talking about. Who wants to go to heaven when you die? Mm-hmm. That is not a gospel presentation. Mm-hmm. I have a, I tell us a story in the book that I have a friend who's a children's minister in the rural Florida panhandle and they had vacation Bible school and customary for their vacation Bible school was on the last day, the children's minister would go up and the parents would come for kind of the end of the week celebration. They'd sing their songs and the children's minister would come up and give a basic, you know, basic gospel presentation. We've had an amazing week this week though, before about anything else been about Jesus. Here's what it means to believe in Jesus and to know Jesus. Here's what he's done for us. And then who wants to, you know, trust in Jesus today? You know, who wants to do that? Who wants to give their life to Christ, repent of their sins? Because you believe that Jesus died for you, that he rose again, like that, that we need him for our salvation because God's going to punish sin. But thankfully, by his grace, he has given us Jesus to be punished for crimes he did not commit, sins he did not commit uh, in our place. And this is a, a gospel presentation that kids can understand uh, more, more thorough than I just than I just explained in, in our short time together here. Uh, but then they do kind of like a who prayed that prayer today? And some of the kids raised their hand. That's so awesome. And they had follow-up and those type of things. She comes off the stage, and the pastor of the church comes up to her and says, I I need to go up there. And she's like, okay, that's fine. Are you going to do the closing or are you going to pray? She goes, no, not enough kids accepted Christ. And she goes, what do you mean? We just had like 10 kids raise their hand. Like we're rejoicing. So that wasn't enough. So he goes on stage. This is a true story. It it, it should feel that bizarre to you. Uh, This is commonplace, believe it or not, especially in the South. The pastor is up on stage and says, boys and girls, we had a great week of vacation Bible school. Yay, everybody cheers. Who here today wants to make sure that you're going to heaven when you die? If you want to go to heaven when you die, raise your hand. I think the atheists just raised their hand. Right? <laughs> and, and so everyone in the room raised their hand, all the kids. If you want to go to heaven when you die, pray this prayer after me. And then they declared all those kids to be saved. Yeah. Wow. So we just said, who wants to go to heaven when you die and repeat this prayer after me? I'm not trying to say that children can't come to faith in Christ. Jesus said, let the children come to me. But let's not forget what he said. Let the children come to me, like actually to him. Mm -hmm. Not hocus pocus, not heaven when you die, not superstition, but actually to Christ. So we love to say, well, Jesus said, let the children come to me. And I want to respond by that by saying, exactly. Make sure that what they're coming to is actually Christ Mm -hmm. and what he has done, not church rite of passage. So a parent who has a four-year-old son or daughter who comes to him this week and says, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. And the parent's thinking, do you even understand what you're talking about? Where did that come from? Do you pray a prayer with a kid? And then do you go to bed that night going, our son became a Christian today? I would say no. I would say if, if your child comes to you and says, I want a four-year-old child and says, I want to accept Jesus into my heart. Be like, that's great. Let's talk about Jesus and kind of go away from the heart part and the ask Jesus in my heart part. Because again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not in the Bible either. It's something we made up you know, in Christian culture, you know, in kind of recent history, mm-hmm. like last, you know, hundred years kind of history, very, very new in all of church history. Again, not bad, not even wrong, just not really a biblical concept. Uh, so I would just say, that's awesome. That's great. And just have conversations about God and, and, and read them stories from the Bible about God and, and, and read them Sally Lloyd-Jones' Jesus storybook Bible right, to them, right. you know, to help them understand those type of things and just kind of go away from that one actually is in my heart and instead just go into like how God loves them and what that means and how that love, you know, help them understand that it's just not just a random love, but like they love their puppy. 
like here's how much God loves them. Here's yeah. what God's done for them. Yeah. So I'd say hold the phone, but have also, not hold the phone on conversations. <laughs> right. Hold the phone on this is a family milestone because Billy accepted Jesus. Do you think there is an age? that uh, they can sort of process and understand the gospel? I'm not, not a cutoff age. I, I think it's kid by kid. You know, I, I think that they just have to have to be able to really understand. But at the same time, they can understand math and they can understand, you know, difficult concepts at school. They can definitely understand the gospel. So for my son, uh, Tommy, rather than a moment, we got to get away from that. Like it's a moment and a second and a time kind of approach. Uh, so my oldest son, Tommy's 12. And for us, he didn't have a seven-year-old, eight-year-old or nine-year-old prayer moment. He had like a six year just running as we go conversation of being in church, being exposed to the Bible, being exposed to other Christians, hearing the gospel over and over again. And for us, like the time where like his moment, I guess, was when he got baptized. Like that was his public profession. That didn't save him. But like when he was 12 years old, we just turned 12. He goes going into sixth grade at the time. He was about a year ago. We sat down and he told me he wanted to get baptized. He had seen others get baptized. So we said, okay, let's talk about it. Here's what it is. Theologically, you look at that and go, there was a point in time. There was a new birth moment in that six-year period. You just can't put your finger on what that moment was, right? Yes, I definitely believe in a new birth, without a shot of a doubt. Uh, but I just, you know, the exact second moment, I, I'm not sure when that was. It was like a, and I don't think that new birth is a process either. I do believe it happens and it's instantaneous. But we have made that phenomena, that theological even mystery, not, not the mystery of a new birth, but how that all comes about. Uh, we have made it into like a three-minute conversation at the dinner table, you know, with, with mom and dad. I'm not saying it can't be that, but I'm not saying it has to be that mm-hmm. either. So we just, we just were patient. We're just going to trust God's sovereignty in that too. We also were, we didn't sit on our hands. We were constantly having conversations. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think some parents could be listening, thinking, well, what am I not supposed to ask them if they want to know Jesus? Or So they're kind of freaking out right now. But I think that conversation and continually sharing the gospel of what that means and kind of fielding questions and, and asking them questions and letting them ask us questions is really important. And then to continue that into teenage years, because I think what we can do as parents is think, oh, they prayed that prayer when they were three or four, they're good. And so then the conversation stops. Right. But at going into teenagers, I think to continually be asking, that's why for Dave, he didn't want our kids to be baptized when that was, and this is just a personal decision because he's like, I want to see their faith displayed. I want it to be them wanting it, not wanting them to please us. Mm -hmm. We had an extended conversation on this subject years ago with a guy named Jim Elif, and there's a podcast on our website at familylifetoday.com if listeners would like to listen to a long exploration of this whole issue of childhood conversion and childhood evangelism. But I remember him saying, if your son or daughter comes to you and and has any kind of a spiritual inclination, hmm. whatever that is, celebrate it, delight in it, pour fuel on that fire. Just don't assume that that momentary spiritual inclination means any more than when they come the next day and say, when I grow up, I want to be a dinosaur, you know, <laughs> because that's where they are in processing things. So delight and rejoice, mm-hmm. and but just don't draw a conclusion that a four-year-old's spiritual interest is anything more than just a momentary thing. Oh, I agree 100%. And it's one of those things where we we have such strong conviction about it. I think we've had like three kids get baptized ever in the history of our church, and we baptized a heck of a lot of people in those years. And by kids, I mean like elementary school, kind of younger age kids. But so often in kind of evangelical life, there's just that rush. There's that, it's like a rite of passage. And I'm just like, just pump the brakes, <laughs> you know, but not pump the brakes on conversation. Right. Let's go full throttle on that. But with the baptism, like that, that is the public profession. It's the hand raise is not the public profession. Well, let me and, ask you In the this. scriptures, it's baptism. As a pastor, as a man who preaches, do you do an altar call? Every now and then, uh, again, it's it's a recent phenomena in church history. You know, now a call for someone to respond to the gospel is not a recent phenomena, but the altar call is definitely a recent phenomena. And it's very American based. We got to remember those kind of things. We got to right. think: How come Christians for this many hundreds and hundreds of years never did that? Uh, but there's a call to faith and repentance, and and then to respond those type of things. But altar call for us, again, I, I think it was Moody who said. I like my way of doing evangelism better than your way of not doing evangelism. So I'm not going to be critical of altar calls. I just don't think that they are necessary and the end all of end all. And anyone, the one thing I will be critical a little bit is it's easy to manipulate people. 
and set the mood. And you know, people came to faith in Christ before the keyboards played in the background <laughs> and before the pastor said every head bowed and every eye closed. Like through hundreds of years of church history, people came to know Jesus before those things. That doesn't mean those things are bad. I'm not, and I'm not saying those things are wrong. I'm just saying we can't believe that that has to be the evangelism mm-hmm. strategy. And I came to Christ on an altar call. So I do believe God uses those. Mm-hmm. Many people listening to this came that way. Also, many people falsely were assured because of an altar call. And we just have to make sure, again, we're clear. We're not trying to manipulate. We're clear. Yeah, to that point, I've talked to moms and dads whose sons or daughters have become wayward, sometimes in extreme waywardness, like don't go to church, divorce two or three times, now living with somebody, doing drugs, and the mom or the dad says, you know, my, my one hope is when they were seven, they prayed. And I, I think he seriously meant it when he was seven. And I will say to that parent, that should not give you confidence. That can give you hope that your child was converted, but their current life works against that hope. So it's better to have a confidence than it is to have a hope that your child is converted. And if you want a confidence, you need to keep sharing the gospel. Of course, I've, I've said to folks, the gospel is not something you just share with unsaved people. We need to be sharing the gospel with one another all the time because I need the gospel. I need to re-remember the gospel every day. If your wayward young adult or teenage child themselves tells you they're not a Christian, they're not. And I know that's very painful for a lot of people, but sometimes one of the biggest barriers to reaching an unsaved Christian or a cultural Christian or a nominal Christian, whatever title you want to use, is those parents right. who, again, love Jesus, who love their child, but 50-year-old mom and dad insist their child is a Christian when he will even tell you yeah. that he's not. And that's an evangelism barrier. They're not having those gospel conversations because I was there at Grace Church mm-hmm. when he knelt down at the pastor and asked Jesus into his heart. And for the listeners out there, like, do you see what we've done with this culture? That like, we've just created false assurance everywhere and we've made it wrong to question whether or not someone's saved. In evangelical American circles, that's considered a bad thing to do, Mm. where Paul wrote, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith to the Corinthian church. And I I think it's very appropriate to not manipulate someone to doubt all the time. We're not supposed to doubt either. We're supposed to examine and make sure that we are in the faith. And what that looks like is that my assurance is not in a decision. It's actually in Christ. Mm. So when someone says, we don't remember the day or the time when you got saved, you might not be. I'm like, stop that. And if somebody is saying to you, you know, I just, I want, I want to thank the man upstairs, you know, thank the good Lord. And, and using that kind of conversational language, again, don't presume that it's Jesus they're talking about, right? Exactly. Because cultural Christianity loves a very generic and vague mm-hmm. God and Jesus with mm-hmm. no definition, no cross, no judgment. I love that's not even the true love of the Bible. It's just a vague love, just kind of love for the sake of love, not a love that's grounded in what God's done for us and his grace and mercy. And we want them to know this, and understand this and believe this because it's for them, right? Yeah. What does it look like to you when you see somebody and think this person is a believer in Christ? What are you looking for? The first thing I'm looking for out of the gate is what they believe and not just a generic belief in God. James said, oh, you believe in God? Okay, so do the demons. So we're not talking about this vague, generic belief in the big guy upstairs. I want to know what they believe to be true about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Like, what has he actually, truly done? I'm not asking them to write a theological paper. You know, I want to make sure they're clear on what we call first-tier issues, that Jesus died for our sins, he was risen again. Like, those things have to be clear. And then not just academically, but that actually, then it means something. That's the next thing. Like, there's been a repentance of sin. There's been a response to that. So I'm looking for belief, which we'll call faith, but like not generic faith, like faith in the Jesus of the Bible. And then I want to look for repentance that that has led to them forsaking their former life and living the new creation that God has given them. Mm. You know, I preached recently through the the book of First John, and John is dealing with this issue of people who are saying we're the real followers of Jesus. They're they're false teachers in this case. But he says, you want to know the true from the false? He said, look at what they believe about Jesus, look at how they live, and look at how they love. Mm. And those are three pretty good tests. Is your relationship with others and how that's going, is that different than it used to be? Are the the choices you're making about your life, are those different than they used to be? Is what you believe about Jesus different than it used to be? If it's not, you ought to pull back and go, 
am I really here? If it is, that's pretty good evidence. I remember a guy coming up to me one Sunday after church. I just finished a message. He came up and he said, I think I need what you were talking about. And I said, tell me more. And he said, well, you know, you were talking about needing to have a relationship with Jesus and about having faith and believing in God and living your life that way. I think I need that. And I uh, said to him, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and this week, I want you to read the Gospel of John. Do you know where that is in your Bible? And I showed him where it was in his Bible. I want you to read it. And then next week, I want to have a conversation with you about what you read in the Gospel of John and just see what you think about it and what you saw there. Now, there's some people who would have said, why didn't you just pray the prayer with him right there? I mean, it's ripe fruit. Just pick it. And I was going, I I just want to know, is the spirit really at work here or what's really going on? Well, he came back the next Sunday. Soon as I said amen at the end of the service, he's right back up. And he said, I read the Gospel of John. In fact, I read the whole gospel every day. I read it seven times. Now, at that point, I go, there's something going on. Because most people don't go home and say, i got to read this again. Yeah, like, what's my excuse? Well, seven times. (laughs) (laughs) So at that point, I'm going, I can't diagnose fully. And, And you've been here as a pastor, right? You don't know, is this really a work of the Spirit or is this something else going on in somebody's life? But when somebody has a hunger for God's Word and they're reading it day in and day out, I'm going, something's happening here. And Lord, we're going to trust that this is the case. And that's where we did have a time of prayer and where he trusted Christ and then was baptized after that. Did you ever think if he had gone home that first Sunday and got hit by a truck? That... I had somebody ask me that same question. But, you know, <laughs> that's why like, I'm asking you, why Bob. I want to hear you. Why didn't you pray with him then? What had happened? And I said, well, I said two things. First of all, if it's really spiritual, if this is a real spiritual experience, It's not the prayer that's going to bring him to faith. He's already there. Exactly. And then the second thing I thought is, if God can't keep him alive for a week (laughs) until we get back to have this conversation, we got a bigger problem in the sovereignty of God that's like, oh, man, if you just had prayed with him, I could have gotten him saved. But instead, that truck came along and I couldn't stop it. So I I think we have to trust the sovereignty of God. Good answer. (laughs) I want to encourage our listeners to get a copy of your book, Dean, because I think this is an important book. As we interact with family members and with friends, the book is called The Unsaved Christian, Reaching Cultural Christianity with the Gospel. You can go to our website, familylifetoday.com, to order a copy, or you can call 1-800-FL-TODAY to get a copy. Again, the title of the book, The Unsaved Christian by Dean and Sarah. Go to familylifetoday.com to order or call 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. Now, just a couple days to go before it's 2021, and I know a lot of us have been waiting for this calendar page to turn and to start a new year that hopefully will be less crazy than 2020 was. Here at Family Life, we're anxious for the new year to begin as well, but we're also anxious about the next couple of days because what happens in the next couple of days will determine a lot of what happens in 2021 for us. We have a a matching gift. We mentioned this earlier, a matching gift that's been made available, $2.7 million that has been provided for us. And as long as we hear from Family Life Today listeners, every donation that is sent in from a listener like you will be matched dollar for dollar until that fund runs dry. And right now, we still have a ways to go to get to that number. So we'd like to ask you to consider today a year-end contribution to support the ongoing work of Family Life today and to help us finish this year where we need to be. When you make that donation, in addition to your donation being matched dollar for dollar, we're also going to send you a copy of my book, Love Like You Mean It, all about what real love looks like in marriage. We look at 1 Corinthians 13 and see the aspects of biblical God-centered love. And we'll send you a flash drive that includes more than 100 Family Life Today programs from the last 28 years. The flash drive and the book are yours when you make a year-end donation today. You can do that easily online at familylifetoday.com or you call 1-800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. 
Now, tomorrow we're going to continue talking about different kinds of cultural Christianity. We're going to talk about Bible Belt Christianity. Dean and Sarah has some concerns about the way that gets lived out in some parts of our country. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Hope you can be with us for that. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch, along with our entire broadcast production team. On behalf of our hosts, Dave and Ann Wilson, I'm Bob Lapine. We'll see you next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas, a crew ministry. Help for today, hope for tomorrow.